So, <clears throat> as Professor Dukar mentioned, this is definitely a unique setting. I did study in London and there I had experience with Buddhist studies and uh, years later I had the opportunity to talk uh, to actually lead one semester in uh, Oxford teaching Buddhist philosophy. <clears throat> For some reason, uh, us in India and larger Asia, we also have adopted this attitude of studying ancient wisdom in the context of what they call objectively. So, um, the uniqueness of this situation today is uh, not only I, a clergy person, is doing this, but the whole um, manner and the ritual uh, the flowers, the incense, statues, and all the homage and the beautiful um, chant probably is a bit alien to the uh, academic world. Of course, we have to appreciate critical study in fact, it is important to know that 2,500 years ago, Buddha was one of those few great beings who actually emphasized in critical thinking and critical studies. He himself said that his teachings should never be taken for face value, that it has to be analyzed and thought about and if it is good then you should take it as a path. In fact, I, I believe that this is very much Indian value. Probably this is why also the Indians are very argumentative. Sometimes they argue all together at once. I can never make out who, who, who is talking what whenever I watch this, uh, I forgot the channel. The, today, is it? In Times Now with um, Arnam something something, yes. <laughs> they all talk together and somehow they seem to communicate. And this is something that I need to learn yet. <clears throat> um, after all, what is objective? There is, from the, especially from the Yogacharyan and the Chittamatan school of Buddhism, there is no such thing as objective. As long as there is a involvement of a human mind, it is always a subjective thing. So, having said that, this, the academic uh, personals here might also appreciate um, these rituals and uh, 
um, nuances that we are creating as a, a study and uh, analytical, uh, you know, uh, case. I'm sure, even though what I am going to, what I'm going to try and deliver here has been passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years and deeply rooted to India. In fact, um, a great work of Nalanda University and a Gujarati, since Shandadeva was a Gujarati, um, there must have been, I'm sure there has been a lot of dilution, corruption, but nevertheless, this, the teaching method that I'm going to present is very much influenced by very traditional uh, traditional thinking and the traditional method. This is probably also another interesting thing for you because not that I'm saying I'm a qualified guru, but India also seem to b begin to appreciate the value of Guru Shiksha Parampara and probably this is something that not only India but West, uh, Greater Asia, China, Japan, maybe something worthwhile to think about because education now is, has lost its direction. Uh, it's no more refining us. It's definitely not even making us think that we have the capability to love and forgive and forget and care and tolerate each other. In fact, the education system now is really making us so stressed and greedy and frantic. I'm happy to present this text once again. When I finish my sort of, not really, you know, it, it will never be finished, Buddhist studies. When I kind of ceremoniously finished, like about 20 years ago, Buddhist philosophy in, in the Buddhist Shedda, I had an aspiration that I will teach Bodhicharya Avatara at least once to five different continents. And I think it has fulfilled, and not only that, um, Bodhicharya, Arya, Arya, um, Bodhicharya Avatara has been taught. I've been teaching this. In fact, I'm teaching this. I've already started this. Uh, in Japan, and it is still kind of in the process. I'm really happy to do this once again. Um, as Professor Dyuka very rightly mentioned, at the least, it is making me feel very guilty, which is a good thing, because a lot of the things that Shandradeva reminds us what to do as an aspiring bodhisattva, we tend to forget. As you, many of you know, in fact, many of you have received Bodhicharya Avatara just from myself, twice, and this would be the third if you are completing. Um, I will take this as a encouragement to the bodhisattva yana path that you seem to be relentlessly coming to this again and again. 
Um, now, this is a very big text, but this is also the most beloved text. In the Tibetan Buddhist study, we begin our study with this text. It's a very important text. Not only it is a very important text, but it is so beautiful. Uh, when we read in Tibetan, it is so beautiful. And I have to say, even when I read in, in English, it is beautiful. And I'm sure it is much more beautiful in Sanskrit. <clears throat> And at first glance, some of the analogy, some of the metaphor, some of the technique, you might find it sort of outdated, but you should not come to conclusion too soon because if you understand the full context of the Bodhicari Avatara, you will find this is very, very progressive and this is very much up to date. More than ever, I would say, study and contemplation of such texts. Now, at this day and age, more than ever important, it's important. Although I'm going to present this in a very traditional manner, <clears throat> keeping some of the advice from my gurus, I will also um, not necessarily follow the chapters in order especially many of you are very intellectual, intellectually advanced. You are already very prepared with um, critical thinking. So I might visit the, I might sort of visit the different chapters and try to always go back um, sort of step by step method, which is how it is taught in the uh, traditional Buddhist um, school. So th for this reason, we may also, I might go to the ninth chapter which is the wisdom chapter and traditionally considered the most difficult chapter also because we talk, it is difficult because in the ninth chapter we discuss things that cannot be discussed that easily. In the ninth chapter, certain amount of courage to get out of a certain zone certain box that we are always comfortable with is very necessary. Without the ninth chapter, all the other chapters, as Chandadeva himself said, is really meaningless. It is the ninth chapter, the chapter of the wisdom, that really makes every stanzas of the Bodhicari Avatara worthwhile. But also, without all the instructions and the technique that are found in other chapters, without them, a mere intellectual approach to the wisdom is also impossible especially if you really want to actualize what wisdom is. In the ninth chapter, hopefully you will also get a clue 
that wisdom that Mahayana Buddhism talks about is nothing mystical or nothing um, supernatural. In fact, hopefully you will come to the or come to know that the wisdom that Shantideva is talking is so, so simple. It is unbearably simple. It is so simple, it is so close to us, it is right in front of us, it's like the eyelashes that we don't see because it's too close. And, and because we don't see and we are not in touch with this simple wisdom, we go through all unnecessary pain and delusion and illusion, yeah, um, problems and suffering, etc. Really, it is nothing mystical. But even though it is nothing mystical, nothing supernatural, It is kind of too late for some of us not to think that it is mystical. And this is also accepted graciously, compassionately. We let you think that yes, the wisdom is extraordinary, wisdom is exceptional, and let and give you, give us. Shantideva gives us all sorts of seemingly ritualistic methods to acquire even though you see even you know the word acquire and obtain even though it cannot be obtained and acquired but we use the words like that acquire and obtain so that we train our mind and lead Ourself to this simplicity. So hypothetically speaking, I would say, when the day comes that you sort of discover this wisdom, you will be so amused that you have even gone through all this unnecessary, you know, maze, steps, um, stages, you, that you actually went through all of that. But when you look at your neighbor, when you look at your not enlightened being, friend, you will also have the compassion and realize that all those maze and all those methods and all those Rituals are necessary. And so this is the time so-called wisdom and compassion are united. And when this happened, I guess, actualization of bodhicitta is final. Okay, so Changjub Sempi Chepala Juba Bodhi Charya Avatara Bodhi Sato Charya Avatara Bodhi Sato Charya Avatara Way of the Way, yes, the way of the Bodhi Sattva So here, Bodhisattva is a person who has Bodhicitta. Bodhisattva is 
translated as Changchup Sempa in Tibetan. It is a connotation of being a warrior. So this is in a way, a way of the warrior. Or also Sempa, the word Pa has the connotation of courageous, courageous ones. So it is the way of the courageous ones, way of the hero. <clears throat> what makes a person bodhisattva? It's very important to know that as many people seem to rush and make conclusion that a bodhisattva is someone who has a compassion or someone who is kind. Kind and compassion alone does not make a person bodhisattva. Bodhisattva's main ingredient, if you like, Bodhis what makes a, a person a bodhisattva is someone who has actually understood the truth. I think this is very out of lack of choice of, you know, phrase and language, I have to say it this way. Someone who has understood or they realize the truth. So meaning someone who has that wisdom. That in combination with a sympathy, empathy, compassion, joy, loving, these are what makes a person bodhisattva. Okay, so now the next question is, what is this grand truth that we need or we need to actualize? Now, this is a very big issue. And this is one of the biggest sort of, I believe, concern for ancient Indian thinkers. I don't know so much about other Indian philosophy. I've only sort of glanced through, but this is the feeling I get when I read a bit of a Samkhya, Nyaya, Mimansa, Jain, Advaita, they are all concerned about the truth. Arguments, debate, writings, poetries, songs are very much to do with the truth, the identity of the truth, how to realize that truth. This has been a big sort of, crudely speaking, hang up for the Indians for so long, until I think recently. So, especially during those days, Nalanda days, this has, all, this, has, this has always been a big, big deal for Indian thinker, I think. Now, generally, from the Buddhist point of view, 
that this is general Buddhism. There are many different ways to approach to understand this truth. Most of them are mediocre and most of them are necessary but not so good. Probably the best one is meditation, probably. Unless, uh, this, is, this, is, this is where things get very complicated. Unless, if a person is so open-minded, but what do we mean by open-minded? Here we mean by someone who is ready to let go the box, the home, the zone. If a person is so ready to let go anything, values, I don't know, references, such as Naropa, let's say, another great Indian man in the past, someone who is ready to go. You know, Naropa was a great, you know, scholar and um, respected sort of um, professor, if you like, of a Nalanda University. And Nalanda University was a very prestigious university. But he realized that that is just a very sophisticated zone, a box. He wants to get out of that. And at the dismay of all his students and colleagues and, I don't know, the executive and the dean and the chancellor of, you know, Nalanda University, he left. And he met the guy called Tel Telopa, another great being. And Naropa, at that time, he is already ready to break through this zone. He was ready. Yeah, of course, after a lot of tests by the Telopa also. Telopa wasn't that easygoing person. Okay, so if there is a person who is capable to let go of this zone, and do you know what that means? That means in, in today's society you will be referred as someone who belongs to lunatic asylum, someone who is really outcasted. So if you are that prepared, all you need is another guy hitting your head with the shoes, and you get it instantly. When Telopa hit Naropa's head with his shoes, something happened that he has never ever, the years and years of study in the Nalanda University never did. Something happened. And it was, it didn't end there, by the way. What happened there, the, the post-shoe incident, what happened there then had an amazing legacy. Even today, like even in Tibet, some of the greatest school of Buddhism actually came from Naropa, like such as the well-known Karmapa lineage is actually belong to the wisdom tradition of the great Naropa. And the Karmapa lineage would appreciate Naropa not so much of because, of because of what had happened pre-shoe incident. Before the shoe incident, there are so many, many great other scholars, so many. Scholars are everywhere. Them in Tibetan, we say there are more scholars than pigeons shit. <laughs> but a realized being is very, very rare. So the legacy that was 
produced as the result of the shoe incident is tremendous. And I don't know whether you know, some of you, the karma per lineage, just that lineage alone has so much impact in elsewhere beyond Tibet. China, some of the, like the great Qing dynasty, the last dynasty in China, they were the disciples of the Karmapas. Mongolia, it has an impact on millions and millions. And think of this, all because of a shoe incident, what happened. Now I'm talking about how to realize this truth. As I said, unless, if you are capable enough to let go of your shrug off, let go, your zone, your box, yes, then something like what had happened between Naropa and Telopa could happen to any one of us. But assuming that we don't have that kind of capability, so then what? then we are given the tool of hearing, contemplation, and meditation. And that's probably the next safest and viable, tangible way to actualize this incredible, unthinkable, unmeasurable truth. So, we are kind of hope, hoping that this is what's happening with a study of this text of Shantideva. We are aspiring to understand the truth at the least initially, intellectually, through the help of hearing, and contemplation. Since this is going to be hearing and co contemplation, we will also have the, it will be good if we can have discussion. So I will uh, time to time pause um, and let you ask questions and um, argue if it is necessary, and analyze if it is necessary. Okay. Now, as a tool of analyzing this, approaching this truth, there are many, many different tools, which many of, some of them we will visit, we must use, that's the only thing. Unfortunately, the, the person who is sitting in front of you is not like a telopa. You know, it's not always, you know, just because, you know, if, if Naropa's head got hit by someone else might not work. It has to be because of also telopa. The right timing, which angle of shoes, how hard, you know, at what time, all the precise moment is necessary, right? So I will have to use a lot of analytical and a lot of conversation. So this morning we begin with analyzing the truth with a technique of what we call to we divide the truth into two, relative truth and ultimate truth. Okay, just to align yourself with uh, what's going on here, because this is kind of a difficult subject and it's vast, so sometimes we get lost in the midst of all that. So here I want to summarize again. We are talking about the Bodhisattva, you know, the way of the courageous one, way of the warrior. Here, the warrior is defined by someone who has understood the truth and having compassion, right? And now we are trying to 
answer the question, what do we mean by the truth? How to measure that? And I'm trying to present one way to measure the truth, which is by dividing relative truth and ultimate truth. Now this time, uh, let me begin with this. And this is probably, I don't know, probably some of the scholars here could correct me, but probably this is one very, I think it's a very Buddhist way, and also Jain seems to do this. The way to measure is, we, we try, okay, in order to establish the two truths, relative truth and ultimate truth, the Buddhist philosopher seems to have this rule. Okay, the rule. Rule, by the way, if you can break the rule, very good. It will be so welcome. But, but of course it has to make the sense. When you break the rule, you also have to create a rule to make that. But let's not go in there for now. Okay, the rule is we do not we do not exaggerate on the ultimate level and we do not underestimate during the relative world. That is one rule that the Buddhist philosopher seems to place. What do we mean by that? When you say ultim ultimately God exists, that's the only thing that is the ultimate, then for a trained Buddhist ear, they hear as an exaggeration. Did you get my point? Ultimately, the only God exists. That sentence for the Buddhist ear is an exaggeration. Relatively, if someone says, there is no reincarnation, there is no next life, then for a Buddhist, it is an underestimation of relative truth. Do you like to ask some questions about this? I just want to know whether you are getting it, whether we are in the same sort of wavelength, so to speak. This is one tool which probably might, help, might be helpful for us to, you know, sort of go on with the discussion. If you have, if you, if, if, if you got the picture kind of, okay, then it's no need. This, this, yeah. Hello. Thank you, Rinpoche. Rinpoche, what would be an example of a statement um, in ultimate truth that would, to the Buddhist ear, would not be an exaggeration? Um, can you repeat that again? I um, couldn't hear. A, a, a statement about um, the ultimate truth that would not sound like an exaggeration? Actually, none. Come, actually, this is good. This is very good. The safest, 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 safest so far is supposedly shunyata, emptiness. Because when they, when they would, you know, first, you know, this is very good. This is why I want you to ask so that I can understand where we need to elaborate. First of all, again to study Buddhist philosophy, it is important to know that Buddhists think even the, necess even the e distinctions of relative truth and ultimate truth is only done on the relative level. There is no such thing as ultimately relative truth and relative ultimate.
Okay. Mm, just to extend a little bit, like a word shunyata, I think which is loosely translated as emptiness in English, does not, ne does not really fall into either of the downfall, exaggeration or underestimation, because the word emptiness, the word empty, which kind of reflects voidness, but it is immediately corrected with the word ness, which qualifies something. Okay, so this is the sort of the way the, what do you call it? Um, sort of the, not really rule, maybe it is a rule, it is, a, it is something that the, something the, that we can, the Buddhists are concerned about, okay? Um, yes, this is something the Buddhists are concerned with, not to fall into the downfall of underestimation and overly, overly exaggeration. To remind you, the example is like if you say God exists ultimately, that is for Buddhists an exaggeration. A reincarnation or the next life does not exist is an underestimation on the relative. If you, pers if you have that in your system of thinking, then the Buddhists will think it is not really the right path. Okay, now what, what does this help? What does this help? This helps as a stepping stone to the way of the wisdom way of the wisdom. Just one more thing with the wisdom and then we will begin with um, beginning of the text. For instance, I'm sure many of you have heard, of course those, old, the, those who have been to Buddhist teachings, you have heard this a lot, but those who are new, you have heard a lot about, you may have heard the Buddhist concept of egolessness. That there is no self. The Buddhists do not believe there is a truly, inherently, permanently existing soul or a self. You may have heard this. But you may also have heard that Buddhists believe in karma, reincarnation. Now, then you'll be puzzled. Oh, no soul, no self. Who is being reincarnated? You know? But harmonizing between these two seemingly contradiction, but which is basically paradoxical, is the way we approach to establishing the two truths. So, practically speaking, let me put it into more practical Buddhists believe that all the pain and the suffering is caused by clinging to the self. So, what do we do? We can lower down our selfishness. But does it really help? 
Not really. If you have even a little bit of, even though you, even if you lower down greed and selfishness, as long as you have what Buddhists call avidya, which is thinking there is a self, as long as you have that fundamental ignorance, even though you may temper down the speed and the amount and the strength of the selfishness, selfishness you are still a victim of suffering. You are still, you will be in pain. You are not free. Why not? Because you have a fundamental mistaken idea. And what is that? Thinking there is a self. And why is that a mistake? Because if you look into it, if you really look closely, you will not find anything that is substantially, inherently existing nature that you can qualify and say, this is the self. The next question is, but when somebody step on my toe, I feel pain. When somebody prays me, I'm happy. When, I'm, when I win a lottery, it is me, I'm happy. Who is that? That, now, now we are talking about the relative world, that is a, from the Buddhist point of view, when you congregate certain favorable cause and conditions put together, out of nowhere, a phenomena will appear, just like a rainbow. Bit of a sunshine, bit of a rainfall, distance, a person looking at it, all this creates a phenomena called rainbow. You see it, it is clear, yet, while it is clear, it is also non-existent. This is how the self is. It is there, very much there. Our toe, you know, when somebody steps on our toe, we feel pain. Just like the rainbow, beautiful color, shape, all orderly, not chaotic. We never, you know, we have never really thought we have never experienced a time that we, oh, this is not I. Anything to do with the me, we never think. This is, you know, we don't, basically what I'm saying is, we have never forgotten. One thing we have never forgotten is the self. This, so, okay. So, while it is emptiness, it is appearance. While it is appe appearing, it is emptiness you know the rainbow example, this is how all the phenomena functions, everything, me, you, car, carpet, tents, food, nation, systems, economy, government, everything functions this way. Now it doesn't help to understand this intellectually, then it just becomes a coffee table talk. It doesn't quench your thirst. It doesn't solve your problems. But through the contemplation and meditation, when you actualize this again and again and again and again, what will happen is you become like an adult looking at a baby, a kid making a sand castle. You will enjoy, you will involve, but you are not attached. And probably you'd be very skillful in playing with the kids from the sunrise to the sunset and lead these kids to the right direction. So this is just a very sort of brief 
intellectual way of approaching to the wisdom that we are hopefully going to talk next few years. And in order to understand, plant the seed of this wisdom, understand this wisdom, cultivate this wisdom, generate this wisdom to oneself and others, all the chapters begin. We sh should we take a break? Yeah? Should we? Hmm? Another 10 minutes? Another 10 minutes? It's maybe another 10 minutes, yeah. Okay. I feel funny to, if I begin the text in Tibetan, it begins with Jagar Kedu. Do you know what that means? In the Indian language, we in Tibet, every single text that are translated, we begin actually with this word Jagar Kedu, which means in the Indian language. And there, we do actually study. And now you have to think in, you know, this matter, you know, let's say this is like pre-1959, okay, like 1930s, 1800s, 1700s Tibet. Tibetans have no clue how it, India looks like. Tibetans have no clue what kind of mosquitoes India has. They have some description about mosquito, I'm serious. People have died, you know the translators. And, and you know, this is so funny. In the classic Tibet, Buddhist studies in Tibet, example, classic example, some of the examples are like uh, ox with a, a lump on the back and um, what do you call it? Hmm? Yeah. No, not beard. The, what is it? Flap, flap. I, and, and by the way, that happened to be what is, what is, a, it's a very normal metaphor for the Indian philosophers of those days and even now. It's, so this is why it's in the Tibet classic text. We call it no kokshal. You know, there are classic uh, metaphors like ox's hump and the flap, the vase. But the interesting thing is the Tibetans have loyally kept even that metaphor, even though Tibetans have never seen an ox. They have yak, but the yak don't have hump or flap. It has hairs and all that. So for the Tibetan students, like, just imagine 1800, during 1800 time, you know, those days, Tibetans have never seen ox. But yet they talk about ox. They talk about its hump and its flap and all that. It's because the Indians used to do. So I remember when growing up, when I studied Indian uh, Buddhist philosophy, always the first day is this, but in my case it's different because I did study in these things in the Tibetan refugee camp in India. But now I think about these things, it's quite interesting. Our first day is kind of a brief historical and geographical and linguistic sort of study of India because Tibetans used to really revere India so much. Even even the classic term for India is Pakwi Yul, land of noble, land of, you know, like nobles, you know, like that. So that one I can skip, I guess. I don't really need to, <laughs> I need to go through this. And then comes a homage. I'm just telling you, this, this is for, just in case you are 
very meticulous academic students, you might find these things interesting. And then after, after these two, in the, in, in the Indian language, uh, uh, Bodhi, Sato, Charya, Avatara, Bhagedu, in the Tibetan language, Changshu, Sembe, Chabala, Jupa, and then comes a homage. And homage was offered to uh, Buddhas, Bodhisattva, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, prostrations to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. These are not words of the Shantideva. This homage is a, um, from translator, translator um, of this particular text, Bodhicharya Avatara, from Sanskrit to um, Tibetan uh, Sarva Ja Deva and um, Palsik of the Tibetan and then also Dharma Shiri Badra and <coughs> and the and Tibetan monk Rinchen Zangpo and then also later Sumati Kirti the Indian uh, translator um, Indian Pandit I should say and then Tibetan a translator, Loden Sherap. Uh, politically speaking, as many Tibetan youth would agree with me, it may be the beginning of the decline of Tibetan civilization. Somehow, the kings, especially King Tisong Diwut and King Tiralpachan, 90% of their national budget was spent on translating the Buddha Dharma. Not for defense, not for economy, and this is how probably Tibetan became very weak in economy, in defense, in foreign affairs. I was told by some Tibetan young people that it is Buddhism that basically ruined Tibet as a nation. You cannot, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting thought. Um, this also reflects something else. Probably like a Jainism, Buddhism is quite not at all interested in secular matters. Buddhism is really not interested in state. In fact, the big boss himself left the state. He renounced the kingdom and went to the forest. This is got nothing to, nothing, but this is not to say that Buddhism cannot engage with the world. Yes, it can, but it doesn't have a state interest. Because Buddhism, actually Buddhism, Buddha Dharma, and the state affair is opposite. If you talk about state and politics, you have to talk about gain and loss, and usually, gain for myself and loss for others. That does not work with the Buddhism. As I say, even to the small mundane stuff like marriage ceremony, Buddhism doesn't have. It's, it just doesn't work. How, how do you say to the marriage couple, may you be happily married forever, that's not going to work. <laughs> you cannot say to the newlywed couple, oh well, you know, everything's empty, you know, impermanent, probably you might divorce tonight. <laughs> so all these have not really helped the, if you talk about spiritual materialism, it has not helped. 
spiritual materialism of Buddhism. So Buddhism, the real Buddhism, the genuine Buddha Dharma probably will not grow in mass, in big sort of numbers. In fact, if it does grow, then it is a sign that that's not really Buddhism. Something else, that there's some sort of a doctrine that has a lot of Buddhist influence or something like that. But the genuine Buddhism... But anyway, this was translated with the funding of the great Tibetan king, and especially King T. Ralpachan. And you know, this is interesting. Not only they funded, they were so involved. Instead of like with the queens and instead of state affairs and all of that, they were very much involved, even to the decision of to whom the translator should pay homage to which texts should pay, which texts when they translate, the translator should pay homage to, they make decisions. So King Tiralpachan very wisely have three homage he decided. One is to the Buddha, and one is to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and the other is Manjushri. So anything to do with, with the Vinaya, Buddhist discipline, anything to do with the Buddhist discipline, what is being translated, the homage of the translator goes to Buddha. Anything that is to do with the Abhidharma, physics, metaphysics, the homage goes to Manjushri. Anything that has got to do with the truth, the contemplation, the bodhicitta, meditation, the homage goes to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So, this also helps us to understand that this particular text belongs to the Sutra basket. There are three baskets, Vinaya basket, Abhidharma basket, and the Sutra basket. So this belongs to the Sutra basket. These are, I'm just telling you this for, for those meticulous, pain in the neck academic students who only is interested in footnotes if you want if you if you but for those who just wants to have a glimpse of the body chadi avatara and those who are wants to practice probably these are not necessary okay now we will take a break and after the break finally we begin with the actual text by the shantideva